So thank you so much, everyone, uh, for joining us tonight. So we'll now open to questions. So raise your hand, shout out, turn your cameras on, turn your mic off, uh, and any questions, then go. I can see Annie. I can see Annie. She's dying to say something. <laughs> go I, on. It's not about the yoga. I wanted, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask Marcel about his... Um, so you call it a storytelling workshop, um, but you're actually coaching entrepreneurs uh, through how to build a business and um, do startups. Why, why do you phrase it as a storytelling workshop? Does yes, it thanks. Does it any like, creative storytelling? So yeah, um, thanks for the question. I think it's a um, very pertinent one. So with that workshop, I help entrepreneurs clarify their message because most of the time, you know, you have a business idea, you launch a business, but you could get a few clients because you start with your network and your, you know, people around you. But at some point, your sales plateau because people don't understand what you offer, why you're better than the competitor, how to buy from you. You know, it sounds very simple, but it's not that easy when you just bootstrap your business to really clarify those points and um, include it in your marketing, in your material, in your on your websites, even when you do a, a pitch, you know, startup, they have to pitch their startups and we tell them, you know, tell us what problem you solve and that's it. And, and uh, they often start with themselves and they're, they're you know, they're confused. So uh, I help them with this storytelling storytelling workshop where, uh, you know, it's the hero's journey where the customer is the hero and not the business owner. And that's a mistake a lot of people do. So you help the hero with uh, your solution as a guide. And then you help you call them to implement a plan, which is your solution, call them to action because people don't take action, you know, uh, if you don't call them to action. And then to avoid failure, what's the cost of not doing business with you or to achieve success? You know, so this is the storytelling framework. So it's very useful to clarify your message, whether it's a Facebook post, a website, you know, website or landing page. It's a campaign, it's an email, it's a pitch. So that, that's been very, very successful. You see a result. Amazing. That's so cool that you frame um, something that's so uh, technical and can seem really uh, like, scary to a lot of people in a way that's understandable like um for me because I'm a filmmaker mm -hmm. um the hero's journey is like a format that I'm really familiar with so yeah cool awesome, awesome. so October 5th I'm doing a free online workshop um oh. so you can join great I'll check it out <laughs> cool yeah it's cool that that hero's journey framework so I used to work uh for not for profits and for charities and i remember we even got taught that in the relation to the luke skywalker kind of hero's journey and, and how to use that even in fundraising kind of communications so it's something that uh it's used a lot right and uh kind of movie making and things like that so yeah you should definitely join i know martial i thought you were going to mention that i think you i don't know if you mentioned that um your course on october 5th if you want to put a link to that in the chat box then uh then go for that um yeah i will do that yep I would definitely recommend that. All right. Anyone else? Car uh, carry any more questions? Annie, Le Levine, Lex, Zion, Tracy, I can name you all. Adri, Sonny. We've got a, even discussion comments. I'm a bit interested. You said you worked in like a creative design industry kind of in Switzerland and then brought it over to Vietnam. And you, you spoke a bit about the kind of the difficulties um, with like a, a foreign workforce. I, in terms of challenges for the actual like customer side, how do they vary between kind of what we're used to in the West and maybe out here, like pre online? Um, so you're, you're asking how um, foreign customers perceive me in Vietnam? Yeah, kind of like, yeah, the challenges that you face because of that. So actually getting clients here was not really a challenge. So I, I had clients in Switzerland, so I was not looking for clients here. But I built a team here because we got some big clients in Switzerland. 
And we wanted to build a team of developers here. Vietnam actually is number one in terms of IT outsourcing, which not many people know. And uh, so it's a great place to find developers and, uh, and, and they're really good. So uh, we built a team here to cater to my Swiss clients or European clients. And then later on, people would find me here because I had to do some SEO, you know, search engine optimization to be, to be credible to uh, Vietnamese staff. If you don't have an online presence, Vietnamese staff would not trust you. So someone told me you should do a bit of website and Facebook and SEO and all that. So I did. But back then, nobody would do SEO in Vietnam. So I was the first one to be found. And I got so many clients here from Australia, from Singapore, from Hong Kong, uh, from Ukraine, uh, you know. Um, so finding clients here was not a big problem. Awesome. And do you find that you have to kind of, in terms of like people coming to you with outsourcing, do you have to look a lot for that or is that something that comes to you because of like SEO and stuff? So people are looking for agencies in Vietnam or outsourcing in Vietnam and they end up finding my websites. Uh, I was not really doing outsourcing. I was more of like a design studio where we, you know, designed the use case of an application or of a website. So there was a bit more R&D behind it and we were doing the UI UX. So that was our... Uh, key differentiator compared to all those IT outsourcing companies that would just do the development and, and not do the, the specification form. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Cheers. Cool. Thanks. All right. Anyone else? Come on, let's hear some uh, comments. Zion, Lei. Lei, I want to hear what you've, uh, your comments about uh, what I was talking about, was I talking absolute nonsense about my Vietnamese history or was I uh, close? <laughs> yeah, you were. Uh, and I hope there is no any governmental options here. <laughs> I didn't say anything bad about the, the powers that be. <laughs> Luckily, you, you, have it, uh, you haven't unfolded it. I haven't what? Unfolded it unfolded it like um uh what <laughs> uncovered you know um, you know the, the dark side of the history of the oh, vietnam yeah. war you know all of that i don't Let's know keep all it for of it. yourself <laughs> so any other questions for marcial or comments zion how was that uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate being on this uh, Zoom and uh, meeting Marcel. Um, you came in 2012 and Neil brought up a really good uh, question that he would ask in the past. Of would you, what would you prefer 20 years ago in Vietnam or now? And I came in 2011 and I'm always wondering you know, our perspective as far as like the romance of it, um, it was my first time outside of the United States and traveling uh, 10 years ago. And I, I kind of feel like I wish it was 10 years ago. And this is kind of a, a thing where when you see something change so much and it changes so fast. I came from San Francisco where it wasn't as big and shiny. We didn't have dot coms. They didn't have these big shiny buses transferring people, you know, back and forth. Um, but that comment that, you know, Vietnam was much poorer back then. And we wrote, you know, we, our Western thinking may be this romanticizing, but I'm still really poor. <laughs> so I really do appreciate Vietnam 10 years ago. I really do appreciate San Francisco 20 years ago. Um, I guess my question or for anyone to comment on, since we've seen such a, a drastic change, um, maybe things have changed a little bit as far as our thinking because of COVID. Marcia, where do you see um, your reach going into the future?
So, <clears throat> sorry. So I think um, working online or uh, building, launching those online courses that I'm doing would help me reach a lot more people and also um, reach more people in secluded areas that don't have access to education, that don't have access to, you know, what they need in order to start a business. So I think now it's really great as, as long as you have uh, a connection, internet connection, and a piece of laptop somehow. You can work online, you can make a bit of money online. And um, that's, that's what I can help people with. I don't know if I answered your question. No, you did. I think that's great. I think, um, you know, technology is taking us to, to such great places. Um, and to, to see the change happen, but yet, I guess, COVID coming in and, and kind of slowing it, slowing some parts of it down that even with that happening, we still can still progress, still go much further with the technology. Definitely. But I think what I would say now to someone that is struggling with the COVID or with the lockdown is that if you know something and you must know something, uh, you can teach online, you can share what you know, you can help people and make a bit of money with that. You can post a gig on Fiverr. There, there are so many ways you can make a bit of money online now. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Just, just like a follow-up. I don't know if this is a comment or a question or what, but uh, it's something I've been thinking about for a while that you, now we're looking at like kind of the expats leaving, following from what Zion says, there has always been like this kind of, uh, I don't know, I feel like it's been quite a thirst from people in the education industry in Vietnam, like particularly expats. After a couple of years, they feel a bit burnt out and they, they love Vietnam, but they feel like they have to leave because they can't stay in the, the education field. Um, and one of the things I hear people say is they always say they, they would love to like go into um, a non-education field and carry on living here. But it seems to be something that a lot of expats and immigrants in Vietnam don't have access to, whether because they don't know or they're, they're unsure of themselves. I'm not too sure. Do you think it's difficult for kind of expats to make that transition from the traditional expat jobs into more kind of web-based jobs like you're doing? I don't think, it, I don't think it's that difficult. Um, it just need, takes a bit of, you know, um, a lot of people, I, I know they're trying to build an online business or a passive income, but they're a bit procrastinating. They don't have the time. So I think you really have to be committed and um, dedicate a lot, quite a bit of time make some sacrifice on your private life in order to really pivot and, and build something online. Some people are scared. They're, they're afraid of failure. They're afraid of not sustaining a living. But I think if you build a passive income on the side and do a, a smooth transition, I think it's quite safe. Is, that, is it something that um, like expats, particularly in this country, kind of come to you for advice for or guidance? Some do, yes, um, definitely. Or some, some say, oh, I wish I could work online or I could, you know, do things online. Even before the, the pandemic, some, uh, you know, you have people come teaching here and the husband or the wife is like staying at home or, you know, trying to figure out things here, trying to get a job, not fitting in the culture. So for those people, sometimes I, I say, yeah, why don't you start a business or start online, do a small gig. And, and that's going to be a lot more motivating than, you know, just uh, staying home or, or finding a boring job you don't like. So to follow up on that as well, what you're saying is you would, you would need to continue your job, let's just say, for example, in the education industry, right, as a teacher or, or whatnot in the industry. And then like any, no matter what country you're in, if you want to start up a side business or you want to start a business, you just really need to dedicate yourself to it. So then you just need to give up your social life, give up your free time. You need to dedicate yourself. But where I see the difficulty in Vietnam is there is a massive barrier that you could do exactly that. You build a successful business. 
But then if you want to leave your job in the teaching industry, you need to have $130,000 to get a visa. So that, that's why I don't know if that's, Carrie, where your question is coming from. I think that's maybe where a lot of expats feel trapped in Vietnam in the education industry, because no matter what they could maybe offer to the country in different ways, the, as far as I can see anyway, and I don't know all the ins and outs of, of visa and immigration, but as far as I can see, there's no, not really many other ways, unless you're an expert in a field where you work as a supervisor in a factory or you work for one of these big uh, overseas companies. So is there another pathway to, to creating an online business in Vietnam and being able to stay here without continuing in your existing job, whether that's in the edu education industry or not? That is a very good question. I think it's a bit challenging now because you have to register a business and that is getting a bit more difficult now. Like we mentioned earlier, you have to invest quite a lot of money, which I would not recommend to do. So um, that requires a bit of research. Some people find someone of trust where they can get a work permit through that company or through a friend or you know through an agent. And uh, so they can stay in Vietnam while doing their online gig. But that's true that that is becoming a challenge. I don't have all the answers for that. Yeah. Is that what you were kind of thinking, Carrie, with that? Yeah, just, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it was more, definitely that is part of what I was saying. It was more of a comment on the kind of the frustration that I see from a lot of expats here um, who kind of, yeah, like I said, they, they would love to stay here and be doing some sort of different job uh, either it be like kind of something on lines of remote work or outsourcing or their own business. But yeah, the, the frustration of not kind of being able to leave their teaching job because they don't really have the information or uh, the resources to know how to do it. So yeah, it definitely encompasses all of that. But um, I wonder though, I, I think often in Vietnam, we forget to apply the same rules as we would to different countries because Vietnam is quite different. If, if I was in... New Zealand, for example, where I used to live and I had a job and then I wanted to do my side hustle as an online company, even in a country like New Zealand, I don't see how I would then be able to be like, oh, well, I want a different visa now because I'm finished with that company and now I've started a business. So now can you give me a visa for my new company that I've started? Maybe there would be a pathway. And in some of these countries, I'm sure there, there probably is, but I think it's probably, I don't know, but I, I would imagine just for example, New Zealand, you would have need to have a minimum investment in your company to be able to to be eligible to get a visa. So I think from my from the way I see it is in Vietnam, it's been a bit of the Wild West for so long where people can just get visas and stay here and renew them every three months and start these companies and these side projects and blah, blah, blah. And then suddenly this year, reality's hit. So what, however it was handled, that's another issue, but reality hit of, oh, we're actually going to follow the rules. And if you don't have a proper visa, you can't stay here. And then suddenly everyone's up in arms about it. Like, wait, what do you mean? I can't stay here. But and it's like, well, you don't have a proper job. You don't have a proper visa. Like that's the same rules as every other country in the world. Yeah. Actually, one thing I would do, um, if you have a bit of savings or a bit of money, I would invest in the local business. And uh, so even if it's like a 10%, 30%, but then you could get a, a um, resident card as an investor. So I would definitely do that. But is there a minimum investment on that? No, there's no minimum investment if it's in the local business. Of course, you're not going to be the owner of the business, but at least you have some, some stakes in the company and that is enough to be able to stay in Vietnam. Oh, well, I didn't know that. That's interesting. That is, yeah. And how would like, how would you, again, from someone who's kind of within the, the business sphere here, how would you kind of go about access to those opportunities of investment? Well, I would want to trust the business somehow to, to give, them my, give them my money. Now, I think you don't need much <laughs> That's money. That's a challenge. That is a challenge. <laughs> I mean... Maybe not when you just first arrive, but after, <laughs> I, I don't know, five years or if you've been here already, I think you can, you can meet someone that you trust that is willing to start a business. I, I think you could do with five grand um, and that would be enough. So, of course, it's a lot for a lot of people, but I think if you could get some money back later on and that allows you to stay in Vietnam and help a local business, I, I would definitely do it. 
No, I'm, look, what you do is you go to Boy VN. <laughs> there's a guy on the corner there. If you got five grand to invest, he will absolutely take that five grand. He's got a company, he's anti set it up. You take your investment and he'll, he'll come back with a visa the next day. You'll be fine. <laughs> but so, so from my experience, so we did register 7 million bikes is now a registered company this year, but I, not any investment in it to be eligible to uh, get a, a visa or anything like that. So I, I'm in that kind of cycle or that trap of I'm still employed at ILA, which I'm happy to be. And I, I'm not trying to get out of that, but I'm not at the stage where I'm going to invest $130,000 and 7 million bikes to be able to, to stay in the country. So I get where your question's coming from there. And I, I'm kind of feeling that, that kind of thing. And it, it would be nice. The thing that gets me more than anything though, is not even a personal thing. As I learned recently, they don't have a retirement visa here in uh, Vietnam, which I don't know, Leia, I don't know Leia, if you knew, knew anything about this, because why would you? Because you don't care about if old people retire here. But I didn't know this either till recently. Countries like Thailand have a, a retirement visa. So if you are getting your pension money from whatever country you live in and you're spending that in this new country, they'll give you a visa to live there. So even though you don't work, you're still contributing to the economy. And uh, I, I don't know, maybe Martial, do you have a comment or do you know anything about this? Because I know there's plenty of people here in Tau Dien and around Vietnam who've been here for 20, 30, 40 years with companies, with jobs, and I, I, now as I learned that fact that Vietnam doesn't have a retirement visa, I'm like, what are they going to do when they retire? Like, do they, they've lived here 40 years and now it's like, oh, i got to go home because I'm not allowed to retire here? Mm. Yeah, true. I think it's, I, they might be talking about it, but uh, I don't think there's any plan right now. Mm. Lei, what was you, were you going to make a comment on that? I, I never heard about it, to be honest. And I'm, I'm quite surprised that you told me uh, Thai, Thailand is having it, really. Yeah, I think it's a big thing for like people in Western countries. Once they get to retirement age, they'll go and uh, move to, you know, beautiful yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Swiss town. people. Swiss people, <laughs> right? Swiss people, they retire in Thailand. <laughs> mm. Oh, really? Is that true? Indonesia too. I think Vietnam, they uh, Vietnam here. They are more open to expat. I mean, like I think it's even more for the future. So I think they will might look into it. <laughs> Hope so. But that it's it's. I think so. For me, I'm obviously nowhere near retirement. But it's a common mm. question that I get asked: is like, oh, you're gonna live in Vietnam forever? And I mean, the the answer is, I don't know. Like uh, that's mm. not the, not the plan right now, but then as I learned about this kind of retirement visa thing and whatnot, like the answer literally is like I can't. Like even if I was like I want to live in Vietnam forever, like I couldn't make that decision right now because there's no pathway for me to live here forever. Mm. If you marry to a Vietnamese guy, <laughs> Le, I mean, okay, sorry, Adrian, Le, Le's <laughs> advising me that uh, I get married to a Vietnamese girl so that I can. Uh, Adrian might have a, an opinion on that. <laughs> you know my retirement plan is to open a bar on the beach whereabouts then, though somewhere in vietnam maybe but then i <laughs> then i could stay i could stay in vietnam as an investor mm, yeah sure as an investor that's why you can open a restaurant then uh, you know? exactly a bar owner you open a small bar on the beach mm. or you get a, or invest a small amount in a locally owned bar mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we'll go we'll go 50 50 mass yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> cool Barry's really good at drinking alcohol <laughs> <laughs> so no free time for you <laughs> so guys yeah, he's we, a really good bartender we'll, we'll finish up like the Q&A part of this this has been this has been really amazing I, I'm so happy